Okay, we're back. Uh, we are here to talk some shit. This is Talking Shit. I'm your co-host, Jen Letterer, and this is your other co-host. Right. Uh, we're talking shit about Inner Demon's Blazing Path to Happiness, which is, of course, his book that's available on Amazon and Barnes & Noble. If you grab it, please go back and leave a review. It's super helpful for indie authors and all authors. Let them know what you think about their words. You know, write words about the words that you've read. And you can also rate, review, and subscribe this podcast. That is also incredibly helpful. And follow Rock at The Rocks World on Twitter and Instagram. And I am at Jen Letterer on Twitter and Instagram. We're here. We're fired up. We're ready to go. Yes. Is okay, it... one of us is here and ready to go. <laughs> Unclear about the rest of the class. No, because so... well, you know what it was? I was thinking about some of the things that you're doing at Jen Letterer. And so I was thinking, wait, can I talk about that now or do I have to still hold on? I think I still have to hold on. Mm -hmm. Okay. But Jen Letterer is doing some awesome stuff too that hopefully we will be able to reveal in the very, very near future. So. Okay. Yes. This is chapter 24, year 26. It's called When Things Get Real. It was getting real. We left you on some really real information. Yeah. So where we left off um, was that my girlfriend and I were about to have a baby. Well, in nine months we were going to have a baby because, you know, it was one afternoon that the news was revealed to us. Um, over, what, two minutes? Is that how long those tests are? <laughs> like two minutes? Um, no, actually that, that entire episode lasted about uh, an hour just from the hey wait maybe we should take a test to we took a test that can't be right take another test are you sure that's right and then just slowly realizing that we are on the other side of the rubicon uh there's no going back our childhood was effectively over because we had to make room for the next generation that is where we left off well, your childhood is over because you're 26. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, we're going to push the envelope News here. Newsflash, gentlemen. Pushing the envelope <laughs> here. No woman <laughs> thinks that they're losing their childhood at 26. Although maybe women uh, feel that way when they get pregnant. I don't know. Well, it's it's this, this sort of a conceptual thing, right? If you think of your lineage... Right. You are at the end of the line. You are still effectively the baby, no matter how old you are, um, relative to your family line. It's when you then become a parent, do you get demoted <laughs> and you are now on the path of becoming an ancestor. <laughs> All right. So you and Stacy have the conversation. We talked about this last time, but it was very quickly said and determined that this baby is coming yes and and so you know to clear it up it was never that someone mentioned having an abortion that actually that word was never mentioned as a question it was so what happens now was sort of my question um no you said okay but we have to consider every option so the th what's the connotation of that anyone anyone bueller no so the the thing the thing with that is that i was just like my first question was like yo so what do what's going on and she was like no we're not having an abortion i'm like yo i didn't say that i'm just like what you know we have to think about this thing that we're doing what sure. are all of the options that you know are on the table oh. um because I wasn't in charge of this situation, right? Um, okay. I'm just not. So her next question was, are we getting married? And it's like, mm, no, these two things are different. So we're, we're in this sort of limbo of what do we do now? Um, All right, because... but hold on. Explain your point of view to people why, okay, we're pregnant, mm -hmm. isn't linked to... Okay, let's get married. Because uh, I didn't want to be married. 
I didn't want to get married because of um, we were having a baby. Because, you know, marrying someone, being married to someone, it is a... It's just, there's an oath there, you know, you're signing government contracts. It's, it's, there's a whole lot of stuff that goes along with that. And I didn't want to just say, okay, we're having this baby. We should just get married to make that right. I didn't want that to be the case. Um, and then also things were just moving very, very quickly. I wasn't thinking about, you know, marrying her, um, because we were seven months in, right? Mm -hmm. So I wasn't necessarily thinking about marrying her. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that she was pregnant and a baby, you know, all things, all things being equal, she was going to have a baby in nine months. Well, that's a very, um, <laughs> literally, that's an emergent issue uh, that we have to deal with. So let's just deal with this, and we can deal with our intimate relationship as a separate entity because mm -hmm. it is yeah i just think that that's an important thing to kind of present and underscore because it can so quickly become the shoulds and the norms and the societal pressures yeah. um you know for people listening who might be in this position or have a friend who's in this position i think it's an important thing to encourage people to separate these different kind of huge life decisions because Absolutely. it seems like when one big life decision is made for you there can be a domino effect of every other life decision that could potentially be attached to that one that was made for you is now also going to be made for you yeah and and i i, I would be lying if i if i say that that pressure wasn't there i mean i was i was disappointed in myself because the appearance of it was simply I knocked a girl up. That's the appearance of it. Not married, not really in this long-term relationship. Everything around it obviously was very shaky or very, you know, uh, unsettled because we were very new, we're relatively new into a relationship. So I did feel a way about getting her pregnant, not being married. Um, however... And I, I think it, it it's closer to, it's probably best to say, I didn't want to compound one mistake with another. Right, that's what I mean. On, like yeah. giving yourself the space, un, unlinking them from the trauma response sure. that can potentially happen. And now out of a control knee-jerk reaction, you're saying, okay, fine. You know, anyway, people yeah. get what I'm saying. I yeah, think absolutely. it's a good thing to like take a pause. And yes, you're going to feel... A bunch of pressure but and like people welcome, ask. <laughs> welcome to the rest of your <laughs> life in this situation there's gonna be pressure yeah and people ask you know her parents asked you know friends other family they asked were we getting married and I was just a very emphatic no I was not going to be pushed into it um, to do the quote-unquote right thing um, or to make an honest woman out of her you know that's not uh, I was feeling, and I, we, I've talked in the book about feeling certain social pressures. Um, I'm not, a, you know, I've as good as I am about not really being affected by other people's perceptions. I, I would be lying if I say I didn't absorb the culture that I'm in, and the culture that I'm in uh, has just certain, um, you know, just certain big bright boxes that. You know, you should want to check. I've mentioned before uh, when I was dealing with my depression and and all of these different things, the idea that I had a good job, um, and what that meant, sort of as you know, being you know a black man, that was important. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily, I mean, well, for me, definitely necessarily, um, but also the context, right? The culture and the times that I grew up in, there was importance to it. Um, the same thing with being married or even um, getting pregnant, getting a girl pregnant and we weren't married. That was a failure relative to the quote unquote ideal. Even though 
<laughs> when you actually look at people's real lives, uh, quite a, quite a few people uh, were conceived before their parents were married. Um, it's not an uncommon thing. It's actually not uncommon for people to go ahead and have this baby and then get married uh, afterwards because, you know, she wants to look good in her dress or, you know, whatever, you know, goes along with that. And they go and live happily after happily ever after forever. So these things aren't necessarily a one for one the way we imagine it. People's real lives are a lot more complicated. um, And some of these scandalous things are actually quite normal. Um, and people go ahead and live, you know, good lives with, with all of these things surrounding them. Yeah, that's, mm-hmm. yeah, that's what I'm saying. Just yeah. take the time to think about what it is you actually want to do in these high pressure moments. And you talk about how, um, you know, you didn't feel ready and you were given this little gift of a little mirror into or window into how you would be as a father. Yes. Um, my nephew. So, you know, I talked about when I was in Amsterdam. That was um, the year prior. Uh, my nephew was born in Germany. And by this time, we are, you know, 9-11. Uh, the wars in Afghanistan had started. And I believe by this time, they had already started talking about going to Iraq. Um, my brother-in-law, he went to Iraq and my sister was on call. Um, it seemed that she was uh, going over to either Afghanistan or Iraq, and she had a baby. And so my nephew was sent back to the States to stay with us for a few months um, because, you know... Both Who brought him back, by the way? My mother flew over oh, and uh-huh, got him. Oh, and had to go back and forth. Uh-huh. Yeah, my mother flew over and uh, picked up her grandchild. Um, because it seemed that both of his parents were going off to war. Um, and so he was around for a couple of months and he was a sweet baby. He was such a, such a good baby. And I do think it was sort of, and he was a little like almost one. He was almost one. He was almost one because he was born in February. So this is January, um, that, um, See that we found out that we were going to have a baby, and so yeah, I'm hanging out with my little nephew, and he's just such a good kid and just very, very sweet, not really fussy. And so, I'm like, okay, that this is not so bad. Um, and so my mother, I couldn't, rem- I can't remember why she didn't go back. I don't, th- I just think she didn't want to f- fly all the way back, to right? Germany. Do it again, yeah, and so, um. I guess I have to fly to Germany to take my nephew back to his mom because by this time they had figured out we were a couple of months in at this point because I believe this was now March or April. We'd figured out that she actually wasn't going off to war. Uh, so, I, you know, she wanted her son back. Um, my mother didn't want to take the trip and she was going to pay uh, pay for me to fly to Germany. So, you know, what could I do? Um the cool thing about it, so from San Francisco to Frankfurt, it was about a mm, 10 and a half, 11 hour direct flight. Um, and my nephew just slept the whole time. Or we played little games. When he was awake, he wanted to walk. He just wanted to walk because, you know, he's a little over a year old and he discovered his legs. And so we started doing laps. Um, from coach up through business class, first class, and then back around again. And we must have done it like a half dozen times. And the flight attendants thought it was so funny and so cute because he was just, I mean, he was a really, really cute kid. Um, So they didn't mind us sort of traipsing through, you know, first class, business class, um, because he wanted to walk. And then as we got off the plane, people were stunned they were like oh my god is that a baby that baby's been here the whole time i didn't hear him once and it's like they didn't see them you walking around no because it's the middle of the night um Mm -hmm. and so everyone would sleep people were shocked and surprised that they didn't know a baby was on board i'm like yeah it's a good kid and so that gave me a little bit of um confidence that i could do you know i could do a you know a, a pretty good job um managing a kid 
Isn't it amazing how much people let you get away with when you're with a baby? Yes. If you were just a grown ass man being like, I really don't do well sitting in my seat. I would like to walk. <laughs> the plane <laughs> for the next couple hours to soothe myself they'd be like sir we are going to have to ask you to sit down well actually that reminded me um <laughs> of what we saw here in pittsburgh um a couple days ago remember the dad was at break no not the dad it was like three dudes um in their i would say mid to late 20s and one of them had a son who maybe was you know 18 months Right? Three dudes and a little baby dude. And they were all having breakfast. And I was just like, yeah, man. We're going to have a dude breakfast. And it was cool just seeing the, you know, dad effort, effortlessly just have his kids hanging around him with his boys. And it was it was cool because obviously, I mean, we talk about this all the time, the need for fathers in, in, in their children's lives. Um and how it's really a missed opportunity that guys uh, don't take because the world opens up to you when you have your kids with you, especially like babies and then like little toddlers. You can do almost anything. You can go almost anywhere. You're jumping to the front of the line of everything. Yep. Because, hey, people actually want to make sure that the baby, you know, you get service while the baby is still relatively chill. Yep. So they want to kind of get you through. Um, But then also your social points go up. It's like, yo, look at this guy taking charge up front, being a father. It's the coolest thing in the world. I mean, women love you. Guys want to, you know, you know, give you a fist bump. It's awesome. So, guys, if you have an opportunity to run errands or just hang out with your kids or bring your kids while you're hanging out, absolutely do it. It's great for them because it's dad time dad time is the most awesome time ever invented um and then two you know society rewards you for it now shout out to all the women out there that are listening with frustration because no one says shit about oh yay look at her being a mom showing up it's like yeah of course she's here with the babies of course yeah i mean i guess let her go ahead but there's no real like oh my it's just a different connotation babe what you just said is true sure women don't have that same experience being looked at with a baby oftentimes (laughs) they're being looked at with judgment why are you doing it that way why are you not doing it this way still moving up to the man what are you single like there's all kinds kinds of shit that goes on so anyway random conversation yeah i guess yeah guys if you can use your child (laughs) to get social points go ahead go ahead listen we gotta mix in the incentives brownie points so um yeah i took little elijah back to germany and as i like to do with you know some some time on my hands i like to take side trips and Mm -hmm. I had to... How'd Stacy feel about that side trip, by the way? Yeah, she wasn't pleased, but I'm like, I need time. <laughs> you know, this is probably probably the last trip that I'm going to take. Not really, but I needed time. Um, but she was pregnant at home. Didn't she need time? No. I mean, she was working. She was working. Right, exactly. So she's like, get the back here now we are in this together it wasn't like that it wasn't like that it was very very early in the pregnancy i was only gone for maybe like a week week and a half so it wasn't like i was gone an extended amount of time okay um yeah so all right so you drop elijah off off with me and i also i also wanted to remember the last time I was in Germany, I went to Amsterdam. I had a choice. Should I go to Amsterdam or should I go to Prague? And I went to Amsterdam like a weed head to buy weed that I could have bought in California. Um, and I had a a terrible time. Like neutral to bad time. And so I wanted to sort of, I wanted another bite at that apple. Right? I'm like, you know what? I can't be in the world afraid to be out here on my own i want to re i want to redo and i decided to go to prague so i show up in prague no reservations no nothing just 
my bag. No hate to Amsterdam, though. You were you went to Amsterdam in a funk. We went yes. over this already, but you were. It wasn't Amsterdam. It wasn't it Amsterdam. Was it was okay. me. All yes. right. So now we're in Prague, and mm-hmm. you're smitten like immediately, right? Prague is. If you've ever been to Prague, you know what I'm talking about. If you've never been to Prague and you have an opportunity to go, you absolutely should. It is one of the most beautiful, magical feeling, just enchanted cities. I've ever been I mean it is it's old um I mean the city is I don't know 1500 1600 years old it's unspoiled by war it's one of the few cities in Europe that was spared any bombing or being sieged or sacked um throughout the war so all of their old medieval buildings and bridges and Mm-hmm. You know, this just thousands, you know, year old culture intact. Mm-hmm. So you go to it. We've all grown up with the, the you know, the tales from the Brothers Grimm and Hans Christian Andersen and all those people. Um, Prague is like the town or the city that you imagine that they're talking about. Prague is it come to real life. It is like being in a fairy tale. That's all I can say. Mm-hmm. Um and I'm here, just sort of out here on the edge, no plan, backpack, trying to figure it out. And I'm standing in a park. Can't speak English. Oh, so here's the other thing about Prague. It is completely different from Western Europe or all the cultures or languages that, you know, that we are familiar with as Americans. They don't even use the same alphabet. The letters don't even make sense. So to you. Yeah, to me. <laughs> <laughs> right when you're in when you're in in Spain we know we see enough Spanish you know depending on where you are in the United States you see enough Spanish um that it sort of makes sense using the Latin alphabet uh French a little bit difficult because some of the 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 letters are a little weird but if you have a general understanding of Latin and some other some other things you can kind of make out what stuff is supposed to mean Prague and it was I, I don't even know I don't even know and they're not really excited to speak English so they're not really excited to nah. help <laughs> so check help this out. out I met this guy which guy was that was it the Jewish guy or I think it was the Jewish guy that I met I met I met a guy and he was like yo I'm standing in, in a hostel why don't you come with you said you met him right off the train yeah, this was there was a little park right mm-hmm. by the train station, mm-hmm. and I meet this guy. We go to the hostel, boathouse hostel, south of the city, right down the Vltava River. Uh, may or may not still be there, but it was cool. Um, and so that was like really the first time that I had taken a step outside of myself, outside mm-hmm. of the rock from Oakland, California, East Oakland, California specifically. Um, And really allowed myself to be out in the world alone um, to now define myself. Who am I without expectations? And it turns out I'll talk to somebody in the park and, you know, we'll just go on an an adventure. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and it was cool. And and the people that I met at the hostel was cool. I met this guy. Um this Jewish guy from Haifa and he didn't want to tell anyone he was Jewish. Uh, He didn't want to tell anyone he was Jewish because, you know, the war was going on. um, Iraq was sort of tossing shells to, um, to Israel and the iron dome or whatever was going off. And so he felt as if he might be a target. And I'm like, yo dude, wherever you are in the world, it can't be worse than, being an American right now, we're at war. It's an unpopular war, and I'm American. So, what's going on? And he's like, "Well, I'm Jewish from Israel." And I'm like, "Oh, okay, yeah, sure. You you probably mm-hmm. <laughs> you probably have a little bit more, um, you know, social anxiety about being out in the world, depending on you know what's going on in the Middle East." But super cool guy. I also learned some things about. Wait, you know what I just realized, babe? What's up? The shirt that I'm wearing mm-hmm. is from 
a Czech Republic prog artist. That is true. I'm looking My at shirt that. says Panice. Yeah. It's probably a little Italian uh, <laughs> accent there. Um, yeah, but it means money. It means money. Yeah. But it looks like I have a shirt <laughs> that just says penises on it. <laughs> <laughs> so I love it a whole lot. Shout out to Belinda for getting this for me. Yes. Um, yeah. So but yeah, I met this guy from Haifa, and he was just telling me about his country. And, and he... hold on, sorry. I will put the name of the artist in the notes because I don't remember right now. It's sure. on the tag, and we want to make sure we plug the artist. So sure. Anyway. So yeah, I'm getting, you know, clued in on what's going on in the Middle East. And like, I, like one thing I didn't know is that there are water concerns. People don't know that. They, they you, you're like, okay, what's going on with the Israelis and the Palestinians and land, and whatever? Um, who owns it? Who was there first? Whatever. There are some real like basic logistical stuff, like you know, there's only like one water source, so who controls that and the and water pollution and who's going to do what? There's all these like very boring and 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 policy wonk stuff, and I'm like, okay, this is way way different than anything that we actually get in the media. Um, yeah, I'm. What are we talking about? I'm, we're talking about being in Prague, and we're talking right, about but, just. And this guy told you this story. Yeah, he's telling me about what it's like being from Israel. Oh, okay. And he's, you know, we're I'm meeting people. I'm uh-huh. getting out. I'm learning about other people, and I'm learning uh-huh. about the world, and I'm learning about myself. Right. Because as an American, I'm coming in thinking that I know something about the world, and I'm like, no, you don't actually know anything about the world because you've never been anywhere. All you hear is U.S. media. Right, they're not telling you about the water issues with within Israel, which holds up certain peace deals and who controls what. Mm-hmm. Um, he was asked. We talked about um, the hate and the animosity between you know some Israelis and some Palestinians, and there is a um, you know the, the the idea and the conception of where okay Israel is the stronger of the two entities and you know what are they doing and they're not being responsible with their power and you know it it's seen as they have this unfocused hate and animosity towards Palestinians but he's also telling me well I live in Haifa and it's maybe you know 30 50 kilometers from the border if that it may be actually 20 and he's like yo Have you ever lived in a neighborhood and all of a sudden rockets are falling in your neighborhood and you have to like stop everything you're doing and go into a shelter? And I'm like, no, I never thought about it that way. And he's like, yeah. And I thought, well, listen, if some people were 10 miles up the road shooting rockets into my neighborhood, yeah, I probably wouldn't like them either. Right. And so. But you did grow up in a violent neighborhood. Yeah. You did grow up around more violence than than I did. Sure. You know what I mean? Like you, I think that there are obviously different levels sure. of PTSD that, from the environment that you grew up in. Absolutely. People who grow up in war zones, it's a totally different thing. It's totally different but thing. But you did grow up with certain ways that your environment trained you to be Absolutely. aware of things and to notice Absolutely. people's like patterns and stuff Absolutely. like that. Absolutely. And so I'm, I'm, walking in this guy's shoes and i'm like oh i can't really blame him for personally feeling the way he feels if someone were shooting up my block i would have a feeling about this person shooting up my block Mm -hmm. and so all of this was really just a again this learning experience coming out of my shell really beginning to interact with the world um that i found myself in mind you i'm about to be a father in seven months and so there's this just awakening within myself. That was really cool. And I was there for like three or four days. And when I left, I literally cried. I shed tears on the train. Okay. He had deep conversations with strangers. He also hung out at night with the absence, absinthe yes. and the strippers and the having a time. Well, yeah. While his too. girlfriend is back in California. Yeah. I just, listen. Hey, listen, listen, babe, you have a way of prioritizing yourself that I respect. I, I do. <laughs> just, <laughs> we're just out here learning. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Love to see it. Sure. I love that for you. Okay. As people say. Okay, but now that your tears are shedding. Tears of. 
I do believe reflection. that was a little bit of your subconscious knowing, okay, it's now over. we're really like the roller <laughs> <It's> coaster <over. laughs> is really like going up the hill, going up the hill. You're starting to feel probably that pending reality. Mm-hmm. So you're back home. Yes. And when you left, you were feeling kind of lifted. You were like having fun with Elijah. You were going to go get away, which is your soul's favorite thing to do. You were like, boom, 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 living life. I'm going to rise to this occasion. Now you're back and things didn't feel so exciting. No. Um, You said my mood was a mix of ambivalence and dread at my pending fatherhood. (laughs) Because uh, I'm... The realization of everything is I had this high and now I'm back and I'm conf- I'm confronting the issues in front of me. Mm-hmm. I have a relationship that's still less than a year. I have a baby coming. We're starting to add things up and, you know, logistically, financially, there seems to be storm clouds on the horizon. And my emotions have always been sort of weird. And so, mind you, I'm still, what, 20 months, 24 months from, uh, you know, Dana passing. So, you know, what what, what was my emotional state? It was, I mean, I was really shell-shocked to a a great extent. Yeah, I don't think anyone would recommend this timeline necessarily. No. No. (laughs) Please don't. (laughs) All of this is a cautionary tale. This is what I'm telling you. But it ends well, so who's to say? Sure. You got to rise. That's for one thing. Okay, so you're not feeling the greatest about the circumstances. I am not. And or how you think you're going to be able to handle it. Probably poorly. So you talk about how, about the day that you find out the gender Yes. Of your baby. Now, I think that this is a very layered conversation in 2021. Because as I was reading this part of the book, Mm -hmm. I couldn't help but also just take into consideration how the conversation of gender is potentially, like, should it be so exciting to find out? Is it such an important thing? These are big questions that I do not expect us to answer on this podcast. But it is something that came through my head as I was mm-hmm. reading your excitement. Yes. So let's talk about that. But also, like, I don't know, just keeping in mind the bigger context of how things have shifted so much since 2003 when this baby was coming. Yes. And how normal it was to say, is it a girl? Is it a boy? You know, boom, excited about it versus now I think way more people are starting to say it differently. You know, number one, they're not finding out or Mm -hmm. they're not celebrating it the same or, uh, you know, you know. So so there were no big reveals and blowing stuff up. Um, Even then, some people, I mean, we got the question, do you want to know or do you not want to know? I mean, because by now. Obviously, you could tell what what the baby was going to be. There were 3D ultrasounds at this point. Um, and a lot of people had begun to, let's say, opt out of knowing that information. They wanted a surprise because they felt like, oh, we've lost so much else. Let's just hold on to this one thing <laughs> that's going to be, you know, that sort of lends some excitement to life. And it's like, it's so funny that you mentioned this. And now we look back 20 years and you're like, oh, wow, that's so cute. You wanted to just hold off the gender reveal to leave one area of excitement in your life. It's like, oh, just wait. <laughs> um, I don't think I understand the conversations that people are having today. I do not think that the average conversations that people are having about their family and the children that they're having is much different than it ever was. There is the consideration of, you know, is your child gay, bisexual, whatever sexual? Um, There's so many, I'm not even going to bother. Um, there is the question of... Um, transgenderism um i don't think that's the term i'm just i'm throwing latin together because people understand the generals of of these 
prefixes, suffix, suffixes, and whatever. Um, there's all these different questions about sexuality, gender, and whatever. But I still think the vast majority of people still fall within the relative norms that we've always known them to fall. Um, and so I don't necessarily think it's changed that much. I think, and I, I think what people are, are, are doing, you, you just have these ideas and notions about, um, what your life is going to be and the relationship that you're going to have with your children and their gender does play a role in that. Um, you know, you have mama's boys and daddy's girls. These are things. Um, it's a bit of a stereotype and a trope because, you know, plenty of boys are close with their dads and plenty of girls are close with their moms. Um, you know what that's like. Um, it, you know, it is what it is. But for me, the only child that I've ever actually wanted was a daughter. Um, would you like to know the reason? Yeah, I'm not on the same page with like most of what you're saying. So this is a con this is a topic that we agree to disagree. Uh, there, there's just hold on. No, you mentioned sexual orientation, which is a completely irrelevant conversation to this because just like getting pregnant and getting married are two totally different conversations. Mm -hmm. Being gay and being trans are two totally different conversations. Being non-binary and being gay are two totally different conversations. So uh, just putting that out there, my those point, two things are irrelevant to each other. My point of, of putting them into the same sentence or very close was that we are having conversations about gender and sexuality and all of these things in ways that we hadn't before. Yeah. So that's how I pair them together. Yes, they are two separate things and events with how people deal with them. Um, but these are conversations that weren't being had necessarily, um, back in 2003. No, I know. Yeah. I also, so. I also think that it is, it is more common than you might think or that other people might think that people are, so are having these considerations and conversations. Absolutely. Absolutely more common than they were. Right. That's a very discreet uh, statistical comparison and then when you look at the mass of humanity and how people fit into the spectrum in that mass of humanity the overwhelming number of people in the world are having very basic stereotypical existences that is just how the numbers play out and that's not saying that you know the conversations about being gay or the conversations about being transgender aren't relevant aren't important and that we aren't having more of them and that we should be you know we definitely should be having more of them but when we look at the totality of the human experience they still constitute a very small part of the spectrum of of humanity um and it has its place that's sure. that's all it is that i'm that i'm saying um I just think that there's more, we're trending in a direction where that is changing. Anyway, whatever. Yeah. So I always wanted a daughter. The reason why I always wanted a daughter is because um, I imagine what the perfect human would be. Oh, my God. <laughs> what? You're all going to start to understand the pressure his daughter has lived under. I don't know about pressure. I, well, I imagine what the perfect human would be. Pressure. And the, and the perfect human, in my estimation, is one that whatever you may want to stereotypically think about what men can do and then what women can do, just the perspectives that we have based on you know, where we sit in this, you know, biological relationship to each other, we're animals and all that other stuff. I'm like, well, women can do pretty much everything that a man can do, plus this one extra thing of have a baby. Um, women, we've talked about this before, just through the, you know, nature, nurture, whatever, seem to have, um, seems to readily access in a, in a, 
motivational way, their emotions tend to be very exploratory of their emotional state and, and well-being. Um, and I always had a problem with my emotions. And so, and then women were always fascinating. My mom was fascinating to me. Um, and so I'm like, okay, yeah, I think it would be cool to have a daughter, you know? Mm-hmm. That's that's really what it was, you know, and maybe I guess all that boils down to is I wanted daddy's little girl. I wanted that relationship. And so I go into this thing. They put the gel on the belly. They move the ultrasound around and I'm having a daughter. And I never really articulated how much I wanted a daughter. But as soon as I found out that I was having a daughter, it seemed like. I don't know. Seemed like, you know, someone opened up the shades and the sun came in. And now, wait a minute. I'm feeling a little excited. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. I mean, we weren't supposed to, like, use our cell phones. I called my mother right away. Mama, I'm having a baby girl. I called all my boys. Yo, I'm having a baby girl. You know, people talk about legacy and your last name and everything. I'm like, whatever. You can keep that. I got my baby girl. Um, that's how I felt. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you then say, despite caring little for tradition, I still felt it important not yeah. to bring a child into the world outside of wedlock. So. So. Explain your motherfucking self based on. Because I was feeling, you know what? Because mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I was feeling happy. Yep. I was feeling... <laughs> 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 I was feeling happy. I was feeling good. I'm like, wait a minute. Okay. Call him in a mood. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'm looking at Why'd this. Why'd you guys get engaged? Oh, he was in a great mood one day. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? That's pretty much kind of how it was. And I don't want to diminish it at all. I actually sat back and looked at my life. And I'm like, you know what? This is all right. This is all right. I had support. You know, my girlfriend, we were cool. Whatever anxiety we had at the beginning that mm-hmm. went away, we were in this thing. We were excited about having a baby. I was having a baby girl. I was very excited. I'm like, yeah, I want to be with the mother of my child. I'm going to take care of her forever. Let's do this. And it was a legitimate thing because I had because I had been so emphatic about we are not doing this because of that. Mm-hmm. When I was actually in the moment, it felt real and genuine and it didn't feel like pressure. Yep. It did feel like a proactive choice. Mm-hmm. You allowed yourself to get to the moment where you wanted to do it versus yes. should do it. Yes. Although I will share with the audience that romance is not his natural state. No. Um, so you propose to Stacy at her work in her office under the fluorescent lights because you know what? <laughs> so, if you all recall that scene, I'm so glad we don't have plans to get married, so I don't have to worry about. <laughs> if anyone recalls that scene from when Harry met Sally. And at the end, when he runs across town, I want to go actually and look at that movie again to figure out where he was running to. Because now that I know Manhattan, I want to want to put some <laughs> some avenues and streets to uh, to where, where he was running. Um, but like that scene when he runs to you know Sally at the at the New Year's party, and he says, "When you figure out what you want your life to be." You want to start right now. I know I'm like messing up, you know, I'm messing up, which means I have to go back and watch it. We have to watch it. Um, I figured out what I wanted, so I wanted it to start right now. I figured out that I wanted Stacy to be my wife. I wanted it right now. So I went. We saw this before with you and Dana, with you showing up at 5 a.m. When you just decide (laughs) you want to just be romantic, everyone has to get on board. It's happening now. 2 p.m. on a Tuesday. Like, it's happening. It's happening. So oh I went, I, I showed up with flowers, unannounced, what's going on? And I proposed. And she was happy. It was actually a beautiful moment. That's great. I get yeah, that's great. It does seem like it was a beautiful moment. It was a beautiful moment. She was very happy about yes. it. You were very happy about Absolutely. it. Absolutely. 
<sighs> and I think I'm understanding why you love rom com so much. It is the part of you that you don't naturally have. <laughs> And so these movies kind of help you <laughs> figure out how to do it. Listen, don't judge me. <laughs> don't judge me. I'm not. I'm figuring you out. That actually just clicked for me. Just take a note. I know why you like rom coms so much now. <laughs> There's their class. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, you know. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so we got married. Didn't mean to roast you. We got married. We got married in July. Yeah, and it was small, but, yep. you know, simple and intimate. Monterey. Lover's Point. Monterey. Monterey. And we ate at Really? The... It's called Lover's Point? Yeah. That's cute. Yeah, it's a little park. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's a, um, what's it, the Chart House. We had our reception there at the Chart House. Okay. Delicious. Um. So, yeah, that was that. All right. So, now you're married. Did it right. Day after the wedding. <sighs> things start to turn. Did I write that? Right away. <laughs> did I write that? Yeah, you Jeez did. Christ. So, this is... Okay. <laughs> now you're seeing why Stacey had some words with you after reading well, the book. Well, and this is also why the very last thing that you heard from me, I spent 15 minutes telling you how wonderful... My ex-wife is because she is wonderful. She is the perfect partner yes. uh, to help me raise my child. All the disclaimers yes. <laughs> before I get into this. Um, we were staying at, oh, goodness. I forget the name of the hotel. But if you're familiar with Monterey, world-class golfing, Pebble Beach is right there. Pebble Beach is part of four historic golf courses so we were staying um at the del monte course which is the smaller of the four but it is still war renowned and beautiful so my father-in-law and brother-in-law huge huge golf fanatics they want to go play golf uh, my mother-in-law they live in the midwest um so they want to go see the ocean so day after the wedding my new bride wants to go to the beach with her mother and then I could go golf with her brother and father. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily like golf. I like it. I like golf fine. I don't like playing golf because somewhere around hole 12, my forearms are all beat the hell because I've been just hacking away and now I'm tired and I don't really want to do it anymore because I'm terrible. Okay, we get it. You don't yeah. like golf. <laughs> so I didn't want to do this, right? I, di I didn't want to do this. Mm -hmm. And it was like, but, you know, please, can I? Because my mom and this and that and the other. And I'm like, this is not how I want to spend, like, the first day of the rest of my life. I don't want to spend it with my father-in-law and brother-in-law. I don't want to do that. But I'm like, all right, fine, whatever, go. But normally wedding weekends are that. It's like the family, doing family stuff all weekend. I wanted to be with my wife. Okay. That's but, what I want. That's you... what I wanted to do. The non-romantic guy. I want to be with my wife. Sure, babe. Go ahead. Put that little notch on your <laughs> on your side of the board. Whatever. That's what it was. <laughs> I wanted to be with my wife. And so I was disappointed. But you did it. I did it. All right. So you, you know, They had day one. a wonderful <laughs> calamari steak sandwich that was Chef's delicious. kiss. Delicious. All right. So you showed up, did the husband thing day one, knocking it out of the park. Right. Now here we are, Off. September 10th, 2003. Yes. That's Yasmin's birthday, everybody. Yeah. Hot day. The Wednesday. The manifestation of perfection is about to be born yes oh so in august we got a 3d ultrasound so we could see her what she would look like and if i tell you that the face that i saw on the screen was the face that i had seen my entire life in my head exact mm -hmm. that's when i knew oh this is the baby I have called this person into existence. 
I knew from the moment that I saw her on that ultrasound, that 3D ultrasound, I'm like, I know exactly who she is. And I was excited. Mm-hmm. And fast forward three weeks, a month, here's the day. Um, we get induced, five o'clock. 5 a.m. Sure. And, you know, it's a long ass day. For not, who? Not much is going on for everyone <laughs> in their own ways. Yeah. Right. She's sitting there. She's not really dilating. They're trying to adjust the medicine. She opted for no epidural. Um, Baller but she was good. move. Yeah. Baller move. Um, you know, and it was just kind of a whole lot of nothing. My mother was there. Her parents were there. It was just hot. I was. It was hot inside the hospital. No, it was just a hot day. It oh. felt very hot. felt very oppressive. Mm-hmm. I was really maybe half present. And when I say half present, mentally I was all there. Everything else was just sort of, you know. Sure. Got, yeah, heightened, yeah. heightened, heightened. You're like almost out yeah. of body. I am on my, I'm on, my, on the balls of my feet. Like, mm-hmm. what do I need to do? What mm-hmm. I need to do? Um, which is like the most exhausting stance to be in. The, yeah. Uh, the hurry up and wait vibe. Hurry up and wait. Is exhausting. And so they were like, why don't you go get something to eat? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, no, this is, I have a job to do. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm working here. And they're like, just just go, get out of the hospital, relax, do whatever. And, and she also asked she wanted you to me leave gone. because you had a very concerned look on your face and yeah. she couldn't like focus. Yeah, she with wanted that. me gone and, you know, and, and not in a bad way. It wasn't, there was nothing bad. There was just a lot of tension in the air. So it was like, let's just break up a couple of things. Yeah, so let's get him out of here. We're out. <laughs> I'm out with her parents trying to grab something to eat and get a call you should hurry back the baby's coming so now i'm like motherfucker listen to you people so now i'm trying to wrap up whatever it is that i'm doing i'm on the way back to the hospital i'm rushing back in the doctor's not there i'm like well where is the doc you know and if people who have gone through this situation realize no the the actual doctor never really shows up until the very end Mm -hmm. um it's all the nurses shout out to the nurses um, so yeah, I'm there. The doc shows up maybe 10 minutes later. Another 10 minutes after that, I have a baby. And it was actually, I remember, I remember nothing. And then all of a sudden, baby, that's exactly what it felt like. It was like nothing. <laughs> Wait, you can see the head and then baby. Almost like it was like just a cut frame, uh-huh. it was like nothing than baby. Um, and I'm just like, okay, put the baby, you know, got the baby, checked everything, cool. Time to cut the umbilical cord. Here's something that you they don't tell you about the umbilical, umbilical cord is that you know it's um it's thick and it's gristly, and so it's not like a cut, you gotta kind of cut 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 through it (laughs) right it's it's stuff there um so well it was doing a whole lot it was doing a whole lot and and so i'm describing this because this is what's going on in my in my head everything else was just observation i mean everything was observation i'm taking it all in stacy's here baby's here mom whatever and you know it's like Almost like a Quentin Tarantino movie, right? All this crazy stuff is going on, but this little small ordinary detail really stands out. So it's like, oh, yeah, the umbilical cord is kind of grisly. Hmm. And then, you know, that was done, separated. Fun fact, everyone. Yeah. You never know what you're going to get at Talking Shit. They have the, you know, Yaz is over in the, you know, on the heating table. They're, they're going through the checks, you know, pricking her to make sure that, you know, she's clotting properly and checking all this and that um but another thing they don't they tell you but you don't kind of think about it is that's not the end of the pregnancy you still have to move that amniotic sac out not the amniotic sac excuse me but the placenta out so i'm like okay well you don't see that every day so i go back and i go and check out the placenta and it's like huh 
okay, <laughs> that's a thing, right? I'm just having this very out of the, you know, I'm just categorizing everything, categorizing everything. Um, yeah, and, and that's I, where we that's where we leave it. Yeah, just Yasmin being here. She Yasmin's has being arrived. here. She has arrived. What's her full name? Yasmin Marie Wangosi. There you go. And I will say this, and we'll we'll end it here. I had no idea what the hell was about to happen next. I just knew that whatever it was, there was no way that I was getting out of it. (laughs) We are in the game.